Welcome to Fairview Baptist Church in Lindsay. Not only do we want to minister to the people who regularly attend Fairview, but we also want to minister to those who live within the city of Kortha Lakes with the good news of Jesus Christ. Come on in and, and join us for worship. It is our prayer that you'll be blessed. You ever watch those shows, those buy and sell shows uh, on TV? The ones, you know, there's Pawn Stars and there's Canadian Pickers and there's the Antique Road Show. And I'm, I'm often amazed when people come in with these, these things for sale, how, how much money people are willing to spend for them. I, 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 something like an old gun, great grandpa's gun. It doesn't shoot anymore. But thousands of dollars people would pay for this thing. Or an old gas pump that doesn't pump gas anymore. But tens of thousands of dollars people would pay for one of these things. Or an old Coke machine that sells obsolete Coke. Ten cents Coke. Who wants to buy a ten cent? Well, I'd buy a ten cent Coke, but you can't, you can't use it. Thousands of dollars. Or... A 1901 bicycle. You wouldn't ride it. But again, something like that, thousands and thousands of dollars. People spend that much money on these things. And, and as I watch these shows, I am a little bit of a junkie of them. There are sometimes certain items that come in that I recognize, believe it or not. My old red wagon. You know, somebody pulls it on in. How much would you give me for this? And I'm amazed. Hundreds of dollars for my old... I think about it. When I was five, six, I had one of these things. I think, man, my parents probably bought it for $10, $15. Now it's worth hundreds of dollars. And I'm thinking, where did I put that? Where, where did I put that? Or my toy guns that would light off caps. I used to take that to school. You're not allowed to do that anymore, boys and girls. But I used to have shootouts. Yeah, it was good old, good old days. But hey, these toy cheap guns made out of cheap metal, um, and they would light off little, little crackers. That was great. I used to have those, and they bring them on in, and hundred dollars. 110, you know, they're worth $5 at the corner store. I'm thinking, where did these things go? And I, I think about it, and most likely that toy gun's in the trash, and most likely my old, my old wagon is recycled into a car or something like that now. There's nothing left of it. Why is it that these things get so much money? Because there's not many of them around. Many of these things have fallen apart. They broke. They've disintegrated. And if somebody can find one of these that are 30, 40 years old in pristine shape, it's worth a lot of money. The expensive toys that they buy today that are so old, they're the exception, not the rule. Nothing seems to last. That's why... Things get rarer and rarer as time goes by. Things break. Things wear out. Things fall apart. They, they rust. They, they disintegrate. And as you get older, you find your body's becoming like that too. <laughs> Seems like everything is breaking down. Our stuff. If you own a house, you always are constantly fixing something in the house. Um, does anything really last? We can even look at relationships. Too often we hear of relationships breaking down. Does it last? It seems like the old guarantee is the only guarantee in this world. Things disintegrate, basically die, and then you're taxed on top of that. Death and taxes seem to be the only, the only guarantees. But are those the only guarantees in life? We tend to focus on that when we really think about it. When we, it just seems to be the only guarantees in life. Everything breaks down. Everything gets ruined. 
But you know what? The Word of God contradicts that guarantee. The Word of God contradicts that guarantee. It goes against that, that, that type of thinking. We've been doing a series in the book of Psalms called Thinking and Feeling with God. The Psalms, the songs, but we call them Psalms, they're the songs that the ancient people of Israel used to sing. And now we don't know the tunes of them, but we know the writings of them. Originally in Hebrew, now we have them, thankfully, in English, so we can understand them. But we have truth that's sung, but we also have feelings that were sung too. And this morning I want to look at Psalm 136 and look at that great thing that endures. That great thing that endures. And, and what is it that truly endures? What really stands the test of times? In this passage, it answers that question. Now, as we look into this in just a couple minutes, there's this argument that I've heard in church life that uh, some of the old-timers might say this. You know, some of that newer music, uh, um, it just repeats itself too much. It repeats itself too much. In fact, I was at a conference a few years ago, and there was this phrase that was put up on the screen as we were singing, and then underneath it, it said, repeat six times. And I'm thinking to myself, you got to be kidding me. Six times I've got to repeat this phrase. And la, 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 la. It, it, it repeat six times. And, and the psalm that we're looking at, it's much older than that song that I sung. It's much older than all our songs in our hymn books. And this song, it repeats a phrase not six times, but 26 times. And the problem with repeating something 26 times in one song, it can quickly lose its meaning in one ear and out the other. Now, the repetition within the song is not something trite like, ooh, 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 or yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's much better than that. The words are a lot more deeper than that. The point of repeating these, the same phrase 26 times is so that we really truly appreciate it. This psalm, it starts off with general thanksgiving. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And then it says, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. It starts off with this, this general thanksgiving. God, thank you. Thank you for what you have done. God, you have been good. He's given us the, ear, the air to breathe. He's given us help in our distress. He's given us food on the table. He's given us friends. He's given us family. He's given us life. And he's been with us through the good times and also the difficult times. This is a general statement. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And then it says, his love endures forever. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> his love endures forever. Do you get that? God's love endures forever. We hear this, and it might go in one ear and out the other. And I, I want to just pull this apart a bit. It says his love, his love being God's love. God's love endures. The one thing that you hear recently one argument within the new sex ed curriculum for the Ontario schools, and Ontario school sex ed curriculum, um, a lot of controversy there. But one thing that you hear about it is within the, that, that curriculum, there's no talk about love when it comes to relationship. No talk about love when it comes to sex. And nobody really says within that, make sure you know what love is before you have sex. And the question we need to ask ourselves, can our government in this pluralistic society where it says everybody's same opinion seems to be the right opinion, really explain what love is all about? Especially the love that God intended. God's love. If we were taking the world's understanding of love, it's basically these mushy feelings. Oh, oh, I love her. 
And, and these feel-good things, I'm attracted. And, and, and then love equals this attraction, these feelings, and sex. And that's what it seems like our world says. Watch mo- most movies, that's the way it ends up. Oh, they love, and so they hop in bed together. Nice, passionate feelings, and then sex equals love in our world. But where do we really understand what true love is all about? We understand it from the author of love, God himself. Well, was that God's intention of what love is, these mushy feelings and then sex? No. It's much deeper than that. There's so much more to his love than this world, the world produces. And what does God's love look like? Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, we had Pastor Mike Kleinhaus here. He's going to be planting the missional church here in town. And he talked about Talk about Ruth. And in fact, I should, let me make this little side note. Pastor Mike and Amanda were up yesterday, and it looks like they put an offer on a house, so they might be moving here sooner than later. So you can pray for them about that. But he, he talked about Ruth. And in the, in the book of Ruth, he used this word, hesed, or chesed. You have to do it with chutzpah, uh, hesed. And, and, and the ancient... Uh, uh, the, the ancient Hebrew looks like this, but you have to read it from uh, uh, right to left instead of left to right. And that's what it looks like. This has said, this love, it's more than the word love that we understand today. It's loving kindness. His has said endures forever. It's more than this attraction that we see. It's more than just hormones pumping. It's more of this feeling of, wow, I really like you. His love, his said endures forever. This love, this, this, this word said, it's, it's rooted in strength. It's rooted in might. It's rooted in fortitude and confidence in a pledge and a resolution. It's rooted in health. It's about grace. And mercy. His love being so unconditional. And we can look at the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And the Greek word for love there is agape. But, and, and this is what it says about love there. Love is, is patient and kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. You don't hear these warm, mushy feelings like a cool drink on a hot day. No, it's more than that. Contrary to what the world says, that it's passing, it's fleeting, it's conditional when those feelings go away. And so it says his love, it endures. It endures, it lasts, it stays, it endures, it does not change. It lasts longer, much longer than than the endurance race that you would finally die at because you don't have any more endurance there. It's stronger than that endurance truck that was built. It's tougher than a tank. It looks as new as it did the day it arrived. It endures. His love endures forever. Canada has been around for 150 years. Now that is a long time. Some of you are close to that. Pastor Steve would be. At least the stories he tells, it seems like he was back then at the founding of Canada. 150, no, no, nobody's here that age. That's a long, long time. But in terms of history, that's just a short time. Um, uh, It's been around longer than the invention of the car. Canada has been longer than the invention of the telephone, longer than the invention of the computer. But in the face of world history, 150 years, it's just a little blip. Christ came over 2,000 years ago. That was so many more hundred years ago than 150 years. 
The Roman Empire, it lasted 500 years. So we're, we're talking about a long time that the Roman Empire, much longer than Canada has been around. And when we think of our lives in the midst of 150 years, our lives are only just a little blip. Just a little blip. I, too often, when we think of the word forever, we, we compare it to ourselves. Well, I guess forever started when I was born. And that forever ends when I die. No, it doesn't. Forever was there before you were born. And forever will be there after you die. And forever is a time we, we have a hard time grasping. And his love was there at the beginning, and his love will be there at the end. And I think we can think of ourselves living forever. I think we can think of ourselves as the center of the universe, you know, oh, selfie. You know, in our narcissistic society where I'm the center of the universe. But really, there were billions of people before you, and there will be billions of people after you. And God knows them all, and he was there. And so this forever concept is huge. It's amazing. And so we have this phrase, his love endures forever. Do you get it? This is repeated 25, 26 times in this verse, in this chapter. Do you see why it's repeated? The people of God in the ancient days from all of Israel would walk up to the Temple Mount, take days to get there, and they would go there for a festivity like Passover. And, and there would be hundreds of thousands of people gathered in Jerusalem, if not millions of people. And, and, and they would be prepared to sing this song. And, and the priest would probably stand up on top of the, the, the steps within the temple and, and, and be able to yell this out. And he would do the first phrase. And the people of God would yell out, His love endures forever. And they would be the ones giving this echo to everything that was said. And I want to try that this morning. Something a little bit different. Okay, let, let's make sure we have the phrase down. His love endures forever. If you can't read it, that's fine. His love endures forever. Let, let's try that together. His love endures forever. You, you're good. Okay, let's not read this like we're reading a phone book. We need to do this with a little bit of chutzpah because the Jewish people would have done it with chutzpah and, and they would have been excited about that. So let, let's start this off. I'll, I'll do the first line. I'll read the first line. You read the second line, okay? You ready? Here we go. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Excellent. Give thanks to the God of God. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of Lords. His love endures forever. Let, let, let me just pause here for a second. This is saying God is so great. That, 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 that God of gods, that God there, the Hebrew word is Yahweh. He, he, he is the great one, the majestic one. He is absolutely amazing. He is bigger than the little gods that the other people may have worshipped. The gods of the hills, the gods of the rain, the gods of the fertility, uh, the gods of the soil, the gods of the sun. And this saying, our God is so much greater than those little gods that these people worship that they were all made up. He's greater than any deity. And it says, thanks to the Lord of Lords. He's greater than any power. The different lords of the earth. God is greater than the most powerful person that ever has been and ever will be. And not only that, not only that, his love endures forever. And then we go into some creation here. It says, to him who alone, who does great wonders... Who by his understanding made the heavens. His love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights. His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. Let, let me just pause here. The great lights, he talks about the sun, he talks about the moon, he talks about the stars. But here he talks about the sun here. The sun to govern the day. Think about that for a second, the sun. 
The sun radiates about 70,000 horsepower per square meter every second. 70,000 horsepower per square meter every single second. I don't know how they figured that out, but scientists did, okay? And it says, if our planet were to burn that much power, you know, that one square meter, all our fuel on this planet would be gone in three to four days. God created the sun and billions of other suns like that in the universe. They all radiate light. And he just did that by speaking. That's how great our God is. It goes on. The moon and the stars to govern the night. And you see his creation here. And his love was at creation. His love was at the beginning. His love was forever past. Has said was there. And so now the, the passage moves more into the people's history. The Exodus. It says, To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt and brought Israel out from among them. We have the tenth plague here mentioned of all the plagues that happened in Egypt when God delivered his people from slavery out of Egypt. We have the tenth plague. But if you think about the other nine, they were amazing. The other nine were, were, were so unnatural, uh, so miraculous. The other nine were, were about saying to the Egyptians, you, you worship all these other gods. And our God just put plagues on them and wiped them all out. Our God is so much greater than all your gods. His love endures forever. And it goes on. It says, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. To him who divided the Red Sea asunder. His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it. His love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea. God brought justice for the people of God there. The murdering, terrorizing, slave-oppressing Pharaoh and his army were, were thrown into the sea. They saw justice. The people of God saw justice. God provided justice in his love, which endures forever. And it goes on, it says, To him who led his people through the wilderness... To him who struck down the great kings his love and killed the mighty kings, his love forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, his love and Og, king of Bashan. His love forever. You know, these two kings here, we, we, we don't really think of the, these two kings. We, they're, they're just passing names within the Bible. But if you think about the context here, and as we understand these who these kings were, these former slaves, these Israelites who came out of Egypt after wandering for 40 days and to get 40 years to get Egypt out of their system, they were slaves. They had, had hardly any type of swords. They didn't have shields. They didn't really have weapons. They, they, they couldn't fight a battle. And these great kings who, who were like the Hitlers or the ISIS of their day said to the Israelites, we're going to destroy you. We're not going to let you pass. We're not going to let you through. But God delivered them. When the odds were far against them, God delivered. God just said, just, just take a step of faith. And they took a step of faith and God delivered them. It goes on. It says, and gave their land as an inheritance. An inheritance to his servant Israel. So it talks about the distant history of the people of God as they came into the, the land and how God provided for them. And then it jumps through a little bit more history here. And it says this. It says, He remembered us in our lowest state. When were they in their lowest state? Really many times. We, we can read about the story of Joshua and how they came in and took the land, and there were some ups and downs in the story of Joshua, but then you move into Judges, and you go, oh boy, there are messes there. And, and then you move into the Kings and Samuel and the Chronicles, 
and, and you look at the prophets, and, and, and you see King David, it's almost like the pinnacle time for the people of God. And then you have Solomon, who was even greater than David in many ways. But after Solomon, it just seemed like things just went down, 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 down. And they found themselves in a low estate. It was a long, long time. Generations of, of wicked evilness where the people of God turned their backs on him. They left God. But what happened in their lowest state? His love endured through that. Max Lucado tells a story about being dropped by his insurance company. Oh, this guy's a pastor, okay? And he got dropped by an insurance company. He said he had one too many speeding tickets and a minor fender bender that wasn't even his fault, so he says. I'm sure it wasn't his fault, but, but he said one day he received a letter in the mail informing him to seek coverage elsewhere. And how as, he ref, as he reflected on how he wasn't good enough for his insurance company, he said the spiritual tie was just too obvious. Many people fear receiving such a letter from God. Some worry that they already have received this letter from God. It goes something like this. The Pearly Gates Underwriting Division. Dear Mrs. Smith, I am writing in response to this morning's request for forgiveness. I am sorry, but you have received, you reached your quota of sins. Our records show that since employing our services, you have erred seven times in the area of greed. And your prayer life is substandard when compared to others of like age and circumstance. Further review reveals that your understanding of doctrine is in the lower 20, percent, uh, 20 percentile and you have excessive tendencies to gossip. And because of your sins, you are at high-risk candidate for heaven. You must understand that grace has its limits. Jesus sends his regrets and kindest regards and hopes that you'll find some other form of coverage. You know, that's how it goes for a slave who constantly lives in fear of not knowing enough, not doing enough, and not ever, ever measuring up. And the fact of the matter, none of us ever measure up. We can never do it. And he remembered us in our low estate when there was nothing we could do to get to him. He has said us. He loved us. Just a second here, Pastor John. You, you don't know my background. You don't know what I have done. You don't know the wake of destruction behind me. I'm a terrible person. I'm a mess. God can't love me. Well, if we compared ourselves to the people of God, the people of God within the Old Testament, we could see a lot of horrible things they did. Murder, prostitution, slavery, adultery, false gods, horrible, terrible, awful, God-forsaken things. And God shows his love. He shows his mercy. He shows his grace. But they turned his back, their backs on him. They, they, for years, they turned their backs on him. And, and they walked away. But where was God? He was still there. He, he did not change. He was enduring. He, he was there forever, and he's still there. And all they had to do was turn back to him and come back to him. That's all they had to do. Saying, my love, it endures through the greatest and the biggest, ugliest messes. And it's the same with us personally. God does not move. He doesn't change. We move, we change, we resist, we, we go our own way. But God says, come back to me. And he calls us back. He puts things, roadblocks in our lives. And he says, come back. Come back, come back to me. Too often people resist and run their own way. But he says, my love endures forever. It's always here, 
All you have to do is come back. And it goes on, it says, and freed us from our enemies. Oh, you know what? Let's try that again. And freed us from our enemies. Much better, okay. Yeah, they deserved those enemies. They did. Those enemies were there because they did some very awful things and God had to bring some judgment on them. And, and, and their enemies were there to make them come to their senses. But God freed them from their enemies. And then it goes on, it says this. He gives food to every creature. Yeah, that's a general true statement. Every creature has food. We all have food. But think about this. Think, think about your favorite food. Steak, maybe, or Thai green curry, or ice cream, or, or hot apple pie. You know what? God could have just made fuel for us. He didn't have to make our taste buds. He didn't have to make all this different variety that we can all enjoy. We, we could have been uh, sustained in life by some savory biscuit that we eat every day. Instead, he gave us a vast array of wonderful foods. Food is central experience of God's goodness to us. This world is more delicious than it needs to be. We have a superabundance of divine goodness and generosity, and God went over the top. We don't need the variety we enjoy, but he gave it to us out of sheer joy and sheer grace. He gives food to every creature. And then finally, give thanks to the God of heaven. He's not just the God of earth. He's not just the God of our life. But he is the God of heaven, the God of eternity. And so do you get this? Does, does it stir your heart? God's love permeates time. It, it permeates the greatest things of this world. It, it permeates the strongest things that could ever come across. All the things that are of the past and all the things that are of the future. And that is his guarantee. Do you believe it to be true? This morning, two people will be going through the waters of baptism. And they will be sharing how God's love affected them and how his love will endure in their lives forever. Why? Because they gave their lives to Jesus. They gave their lives to Jesus. And, and they realized that they were separated from God and his love. They, they realized they could not get to God. But God, in his enduring love, sent his son Jesus Christ to bridge the gap between us and the Heavenly Father through his son Jesus, by dying on the cross for our sins. And they realized that Jesus died on the cross. And one day in their lives, Jesus knocked on the door of their heart. He said, hey, give your life to me. And they surrendered their lives to Jesus. They realized they were sinners. They realized that they needed God's gift of grace. And so they received God's gift of grace. And he has transformed their lives. He has saved them from their sins and have given them a place in eternity. And so they're being baptized today. Why? Because Jesus commanded it. That's why they're being baptized. Jesus, before he left this earth, he said, go make disciples of all nations. And as you make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so they are being baptized today for one specific reason, because Jesus said, if you're a follower of mine, be baptized. And, and so the, it's a step of obedience. Today, they are not saying they are perfect, although Jesus has made them perfect before the Father. They're going to struggle in this life with temptation, with sin. They haven't arrived, but they're saying, hey, Jesus has covered my sin. I'm his child. And, and they're just walking in obedience today. And they're going to live out their faith the best way they can for the rest of their lives. And they're telling the world today that they're a follower. And they're doing that through the symbolism of, of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. And that's what's happening in, in baptism. Death, burial, and resurrection. It's an important step for them. 
I'm not sure where you're at today. But maybe today you've never accepted that love and that grace that God has given to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And really, the way to accept it is just by accepting it. There's nothing you can do to earn it. It's by, first of all, realizing that Jesus died on the cross to take away your sins. Secondly, it's believing about it. And thirdly, it's accepting it. Accepting, just asking him to come into your life, forgiving you of your sins, and letting him to be number one in your life. Lord, Savior of your life. And you start on that journey following after him. As we listen to this psalm today, maybe you're struggling yourself. You're saying, you know what? I got some friendship issues. I, I got some relationship issues. There's some health challenges in my life. And let me tell you, Pastor John, I don't feel like his love endures forever. In fact, I don't feel his love right now. Can I challenge you to just cling to the truth? It, it doesn't say feel his love that endures forever. The thing is, it's a fact. His love, it, it endures forever. It's a fact. It, it's a truth. It's there whether we feel it or not. It, it, it's much more than, than a feeling. You can turn to him, and he'll help you in those times. His love is with you all this time. It's a truth. It's a fact. And he's there no matter what. I want you to challenge you to cling to that enduring truth. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for your goodness. But thank you for your love. That love that has said, that endures forever. Oh Lord, may we feel it, but may we also just realize it in our hearts and our minds that it is so true. And thank you for the way it, it permeates our hearts and our minds and it causes us to live it out in our faith. And may we do that. Thank you for the way our hearts have been stirred this morning with this truth. In Jesus' name, amen.
Our Heavenly Father, we come to you and <coughs> life has a way of hitting us with things. We think of Pastor Vic. The tendon lets go in his arm. And he's looking at three months of recovery and feeling useless with his right hand out of commission. And yet Pastor John says to him, Vic, his steadfast love endures forever. We pray that Vic would sense that. Rosemary Schubert lost her mom this week, Grandma Jarvis, 96. Gary drives up tomorrow to take part in the funeral service. And God says to them, my steadfast love endures forever. We pray it just won't be words. It will be something that they sense in a powerful and wonderful way. Sandy Merritt, you had eye surgery. It turned out well, but right now he looks a mess. And the surgery doesn't really cure anything, it just helps him live with what he has. And through all of this, you say to both Sandy and Sandy, my steadfast love endures forever. May they hear your voice. May they sense you. This summer we have a busy time of church activities with kids camp, with next level, with go mad, trip to Haiti, all these things going on, busy, busy, busy. And Lord, we pray that in the middle of it, you would slow us down. Just bless us with a sense of your presence. So we can hear you say, my steadfast love endures forever. Love us through all of this in a wonderful and beautiful way. And we pray for Eleanor Roundsky. Working for Awana with native peoples in the States. Lord, we pray that as she has never felt it before, she would hear you say about her love enduring forever. And we pray that you would give her the grace to help others sense the same love of the same God for them. Lord, there are people here this morning who are struggling. They've grown up in homes perhaps where they weren't loved, where they weren't sure of love. And it's hard to believe that they are loved. I pray that you would bring into their life a beautiful time of quietness where they may hear the still small voice of God telling them that he loves them with an everlasting love. Lord, we thank you for those who are being baptized. We thank you for what their baptism means to us. We thank you for your joy in their baptism. 
And we pray that you'd bless them forever. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, this morning we have two people going through the waters of baptism. And uh, the first person is a young person who's been here for quite some time, uh, Carissa Evans. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you to come on down here. <coughs> Pastor Vic, it, it's warm this morning, so I just want to let you know that. <laughs> Good there? Yeah. Okay. okay. My name is Carissa. I am 14 years old. I grew up at... I grew up in a Christian family. We lived in a house in the country outside of Finland Falls. I was homeschooled by my mom, and my dad worked as a financial planner. I became a Christian when I was five years old on Thanksgiving Monday, and I've seen God do a lot in my life since then. I continued homeschooling until grade four. Then I went to Heritage Christian School. I met a lot of my friends that I have today there. Things, my life were, things in my life were going okay until grade five. After Christmas break, a boy in my class had his dad leave his family. I remember thinking that my dad and mom would never break up. I spoke too soon. I remember that day very well. After school, dad drove us home. We did our schoolwork, and then we went outside like normal to play with our next door neighbors. While we were playing, we saw our dad put some bags in the trunk of the car. We didn't ask about them because we thought we because we just figured he was going on another business trip. We were wrong. A little while later, he called, a, called all three of us inside and sat us down. He told us he, he was leaving. We told him we didn't want him to go, but he didn't listen. He left as soon as mom got home from work. At school, my teacher helped me with what was happening since she had gone through it too. It also helped to know the other family from school understood because they were going through it too. I think God put these people in my life at that time because they knew from experience what, what we were going through. My mom told us that my dad said he wasn't coming back. Regardless, I still had this false hope that he would change his mind until one day when we were with him. I saw a family photo with my mom's head cut out of it. That hope that I had been holding on to quickly drained out of me. For a while, I felt mad at God for letting it happen. Later on, I knew that God was who I had to turn to, and I did. But I kept on having doubts, so I reacted him into my life over and over and over again. I don't know why. I guess I thought I did something wrong for Dad to leave. Unfortunately, due to some painful circumstances, soon after my dad left, we had to sell our house. I couldn't figure out why all this was happening to my family. It's been four years since all of this has happened, and we have moved into a new home and have received so much help from our friends, the church, and my grand and grandpa Baron. I've seen God work in a lot of ways in my life with providing money, our house, Christmas presents, and even helping me survive grade eight because I was the only girl in the grade. <laughs> I know God is always with me. Life won't always be easy, but he will guide guide and carry me through. I want people to know that I have committed my life to Jesus and decided to follow him. Chris Evans, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you want to follow after him with the rest of your life? I now baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our next candidate is someone who's been coming to the church for a couple years. And... Um, uh, I think many of us, uh, many of you have seen him around, but maybe don't know him all that well. His name's Brian Corneal. Come on down, Brian. I'll give you a hand there. Why 
one more step there. That's great. Okay. He's going to share with us his testimony today. Okay. Uh, hello, my name is Brian Corneo, and I uh, and I uh, have been a Christian for at least 30 years, and I've been a member of Fairview for two years. I've been attending here for two years, yeah. That's yeah, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> uh, today I have chosen to be baptized because I know God loves me, and that whosoever believes in him shall be saved. And have my everlasting life. I feel that the word has spoken to me, and I will give my life today to Him. That's um, a little bit more here. I do remember Reverend Robert Taylor at Oakland United Church. He was the one who brought me to Jesus Christ. At times I call, I can still hear his voice, praise God, amen. He was a nice man and a nice minister. He was just the same as Pastor John, evangelist minister, that I, uh, uh, that I like, and I praise God for Reverend Turner at Open United Church. Mm. Light to Jesus. That's yeah, great. thank you. I do feel the presence of the Lord when I listen to John preach. I feel that the Lord has his hand on our lives. I thank God for that. I have been, have, have not at, at Lindsay extended care for 15 years. I have been here at Fairview two years. <laughs> Finally, if there is anybody here who do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, I encourage anybody here to do so. And I'm sure the Lord will bless each one. I had a job uh, at Travel Ways Bus Company, and Reverend Taylor prayed for that job. Oh, yeah. And I remember that, and he says, and praise God, hallelujah, and thank the Lord that I got the job at Trauma Ways. Okay. And that was, oh, 30 years ago, okay. yeah. And I've been there for five years, and yes, I should still be there, I guess. <laughs> but they fired me, and <laughs> so there you are anyway. <laughs> Didn't do a good job, I guess. <laughs> but now you're at extended care. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you've been there for how long? Uh, 15, 15 years, years since it's been open. Okay. Right. Okay. And I have friends there, and uh, they're used to be pretty good. Good. That's yeah. Good. That's great. Yeah. Well, thank Ryan so much for sharing your story and how okay. God has touched you. Let's take okay. off your glasses. Okay. Let's okay. put them right here. There. Brian, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins? And do you want to follow him with the rest of your life? Yes. It's my privilege to now baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
that we as a congregation can stand witness to that and, and see it happen. Um, people who we love so much enter into the waters of baptism. It's a fabulous time. So stand with me and join in this celebration of welcoming. our desire to encourage you through this program. If you do not yet belong to a church, we'd love to have you come and connect with us. We have programs for all ages. There is a spiritual need, or if you have been blessed through our service, we'd love to hear from you. You can contact us during regular office hours by phone, or you can email us. Thank you for watching our service. May God bless you.